economists have been giving increasing thoughts to the conditions of economic development of the developing nations in recent years. Development has been directly associated with the capital which needs investment. The general rule expressed so far is that nations who are engaged in development should economize the use of scarce capital as Norman S. Buchan and J. J. Pollock state, if investment funds are limited, the wise policy in the absence of special considerations would be to undertake first those investments having a high value of annual product relative to the investment necessary to bring them into existence. This would mean that the investment criteria in these economies should be based on low capital intensity as the opportunity cost of labor may be nil in some areas. No doubt there is a problem of concealed unemployment on the land in many of these developing nations and this surplus labor force must be removed to increase agricultural productivity but this labor will replace capital and will be substitutable for capital is not certain. In fact, substitution of labor for capital is not entirely costless. So, after studying this module, you shall be able to learn about the different criteria of investment decisions. You will also understand the problem of developing economies related to the choice of techniques of investment criteria and you would know about the steps that should be taken to ensure development in these economies. Let us begin our discussion on the investment criteria. The correct criterion for getting the maximum return from critical resources is the marginal productivity and more so the social marginal productivity from the point of view of the society. In real world, industrialization means bringing capital intensive industries. Thus, the problem is to use the capital in such a way that it can make the maximum contribution to the national product and it is this SMP which means social marginal productivity rather than the capital turnover which is the best test of choice of the technique. A second criteria of investment decisions concerns the nature of the final product that is a sufficient investment go into those projects which could increase exports or could substitute exports so that insurance is provided against balance of payment difficulties after the period of capital formation. There is no doubt that the marginal propensity to import is extremely high in less developed economies but investment in these industries will increase both the income and additional supply of goods for the domestic market. The marginal propensity to import will come down due to their probable long run effects. In the short run, it will help in absorbing surplus labor into productive employment and would result in a greater increase in income. The third criteria of investment in developing nations is in terms of international lending both by the international institutions or individual countries. Development in less developed countries 
is hampered by the limited resources of domestic capital available as external expenditure is only a part of the cost of the development. The rest of the resources must be derived from the sources within the country. It is due to this that transportation, power, etc. are least likely to get foreign fundings as they involve heavy on the spot expenditure. The present trends of investment in developing nations is direct foreign investment known as FDI which flows as a bundle of resources including not only capital but also technology, organizational and managerial skills, marketing know-how as well as access to the market through their own network. All these skills tend to benefit to the domestic enterprises in the recipient country. It is therefore considered that FDI helps in promoting growth more than proportionately as compared to domestic investments in the host country. This favorable effect of FDI is due to the externalities of multinational enterprises who enter the domestic market. But these externalities may not have the positive effects if there is a poor linkage between multinational and domestic enterprises or the latter that is domestic enterprises have poor absorptive capacity. There is a possibility that the market power of the multinationals with superior technology brand name and marketing network may have a negative effect on domestic investment or FDI may crowd it out. Thus, the effect of FDI on domestic investment and thereby growth will depend on the nature and quality of FDI. The host country must pay attention to the quality of FDI in flows rather than only the magnitude and should entertain only those types which have more favorable developmental externalities. Not only that, the governments in the host countries must employ certain measures to improve the overall quality of FDI. It must encourage those FDI which help in intensifying the generation of local linkages as well as in the expansion of manufactured exports of developing countries. Even developed countries of today have also used such performance requirements on foreign investors when they were capital importing countries. USA during the 19th century had many restrictions on foreigners ownership on agricultural land, mining etc and discriminated foreign firms in banking, insurance etc. Even in the post World War II period, countries like Australia, Canada, France and Japan have also used such restrictions. Such restrictions have been changed in favor of trade policy consistent with the provision of trade related investment measures known as TRIM, although these achieve the objectives similar to PRS known as performance requirement. The developed nations even made an attempt to push the investment issue on the World Trade Organization WTO agenda where they proposed to create a multilateral framework on investment known as MFI under WTO. 
in fact WTO does not have competence to deal with the investment and development issue. The main purpose of WTO is the trade liberalization which is based on the principle of comparative advantage where countries with different comparative advantages benefit them trading mutually. While developing countries trade their labor intensive goods and raw material with more knowledge and capital intensive goods of developed countries, FDI flows emerge due to differences in the levels of development. The bulk of FDI flows continue to be market seeking type and actually substitute trade. FDI like domestic investment is a development and industrialization issue and is not a trade issue which could be brought under WTO. Moreover, countries at different levels of development receive different types of FDI. The need for policy framework dealing with FDI would depend upon the level of development. The one size fits all approach to FDI as evolved through MFI in WTO cannot serve the interest of developing nations. Since the recipient government policies play an important role in getting benefits from FDI as has happened in South Korea, Taiwan and China who have succeeded in achieving their development objectives by channeling FDI into export oriented and high technology activities as compared to Latin American countries, MFI will take away this ability of the government to divert FDI in accordance with their development policy. Moreover, FDI inflows are guided by the size of market, income levels, urbanization, the quality of infrastructure and the cultural and geographical proximity to the source countries of FDI. Therefore, MFI will not be able to expand the magnitude of FDI inflows. For example, Many of the African countries that have liberalized their FDI policy under the Structural Adjustment Program of IMF and World Bank fail to receive any significant FDI inflows. China on the other hand could receive high FDI inflows under much more restrictive policy framework. Thus, the proponents of MFI are seeking to protect only the interests of the investors or corporations, their responsibilities and the protection of interests of the host country are totally ignored. International investments are generally done by multinational enterprises known as MNCs who own huge resources and power granted by their global scale of operation which are sometimes larger than the economies of many of the countries they operate and are growing faster than the size of these economies. This power can be misused as international regulations have not been binding on them. For instance, Bhopal gas tragedy where the concerned MNC sought to shirk away from the liability of its subsidiary. Moreover, while the investors countries always seek to curb the imposition of performance obligations they are not putting any regulation on their subsidiaries. 
governments of host countries of FDI, governments of countries which are home to international corporations and the international corporations themselves. Similarly, there is a need to liberalize the labor mobility along with the capital movements which has been proposed in the current framework. All the above criteria about the choice of techniques have their own problems. Since developing economies have so many uncertainties as regards reliability of supply of raw material, suitable labor force and the assurance of sales, economic development cannot be assured in by heavy inflow of foreign capital using capital intensive techniques in the countries with relatively scarce capital and plentiful labor and where investment is partly financed by borrowing from abroad, the desirable criteria should be capital turnover criteria. The absorption of excess labor with minimum amount of capital is approximate to social marginal productivity criteria. Moreover, technological developments may take earlier equipment obsolete. It would be advisable to favor capital light techniques thus and select methods which may give opportunities to revise wrong decisions in the light of later developments. Similar considerations are required in the choice of ventures which make no contribution to the balance of payments. All investment programs have a continuous threat of inflation. There may be unforeseen lags between the payments to the factors and sales of the products and the consumers may dissave due to the availability of consumption goods. These situations may lead to higher level of investment and consumption which cannot be met without the support of foreign aid. The higher demand for foreign consumption goods may raise the requirements of foreign exchange both in direct and indirect ways. Thus, there are two main problems of international investment. Investment in a capital rich developed nation is not the same as in an underdeveloped economy. The projects differ and their chances of success are also different. The second problem is that of transfer which has two aspects. At the macro level, the funds must be raised within the economy without inflation that is purchasing power in the debtor country should be reduced. The second is the micro problem which is related to allocation or reallocation of resources which is the result of imperfections of the market. But all these problems although present a challenge but do not dictate unreasonable conservation. The marginal productivity of capital in developing economies, particularly if it is accompanied by technical assistance and if a proper planning is done potentially immense results can be there. Besides, if the creditor countries while assessing the benefits take a broader view and extend loans at lower rates of interest with longer maturities the results could be encouraging but all these changes are essentially political. Given the present situation and the deadlock over possible MFI in WTO which was later on pushed up and taken up in WTO in 2001 about the negotiations on trade and investment 
it has been taken up by WTO at their session on modalities of negotiation. Under this background, there is a need to define the scope and incorporate a development dimension in possible MFI, it will clarify the future perspective of investment criteria. Given the frequency of crisis in different parts of the world, international financial institutions like World Bank are advising caution as regards capital account liberalization to different governments. Since the general investment agreements are not able to keep in mind the specific interests of different countries, therefore there is a need to focus on long-term cross-border investment, particularly FDI. In order to ensure development, dimensions, following steps should be taken. A. The focus should be on FDI, which is a long-term investment and is different from portfolio investment and other types of foreign investment. The majority ownership rule should be adopted to define controlling stakes. B. Only that FDI should be covered by MFI, which is export oriented as the bulk of FDI flows seek the domestic markets in the host countries and thus substitute trade. C. The FDI's developmental impact on the host country also depends on the nature of investment that is whether it's a green field or it's a brown field that is acquiring only existing enterprises. The greenfield investment has larger potential to contribute to trade expansion as it adds to export and manufacturing capabilities of the developing countries. D. There is a need for more transparency in FDI. Governments of developing countries generally experience lack of or little information about the background of investors in other countries as regards social responsibility, their involvement in corruption and restrictive business practices. MFI can provide this transparency. E. Since multinationals have monopolistic advantages of superior technology, brand names and captive access to resources, host governments in developing countries need to adopt some supportive policies to nurture infant industries and small and medium enterprises from foreign competition. Any such framework which gives the right to regulate in the public interest to the host countries must be recognized. F. The policy flexibility of these governments to follow a selective policy towards FDI and impose performance requirements needs to be retained in any multilateral framework. This would give host countries freedom to restrict or exclude foreign investment in specific sectors, use domestic ownership requirements and some other measures at the entry of FDI. G. Developing countries seek FDI for development and it is supported to bring capital, technology, managerial and marketing skills and even markets itself. All these facilities should diffuse in the host country. But not all cases of FDI do bring such resources and some may even reduce welfare of the host country by crowding out FDI. The host country 
and their policies should work in such a way that these could maximize the benefits of FDI and minimize its adverse effects. H. There is a need for balancing the interests of host country and the home country even from the future perspective. This can be done by a including the rights and responsibilities of all the stakeholders of host and home countries in MFI while till now the rights of investors which the host country government should commit to provide have been included. B. The developing countries should also be able to negotiate the transfer of technology as a condition for entry or operation of foreign investment. It should have the obligation to train and employ local personnel and the performance requirement of foreign investment must be related to a given level of research and development. The capital equipment and services should be brought in R&D activities and these subsidies and tax benefits provided by the developed countries to promote transfer of technology should be granted to developing countries. C. The abuse of market power through price fixing cartels, horizontal international marketing merger and acquisition and some other anti-competitive practices are the usual practices adopted by multinationals and effective regulation and blending provisions should form an integral part of MFI for future. D. Developing countries should seek labor mobility as a balancing act for liberal capital flows which only benefit developed nations and E. An MFI for the future must also include an international discipline to limit the investment distorting incentives which would maximize the collective welfare of all the countries participating in the process. And lastly, because there is a need for very careful approach to settle disputes and protect investors if MFI has to work within the framework of WTO in the future. In case developed countries continue their demand for MFI, a different solution on multinational treaty can be negotiated outside WTO. Since the aim of MFI is to secure transparent, stable and predictable conditions for investment, particularly FDI, it can be done within the United Nations framework. Developing countries can argue that since WTO is not an expert body to deal in investment, it can be handled more apparently by UNCTAD. The alternative could be to adopt UN Code of Conduct on TNCs that is transnational corporations with minor changes. This can give a balanced treatment to the host country, home country and will provide a stable and transparent framework for FDI and can save the interests of both developed and developing countries. In case there is no scope to go out of WTO, the developing countries must ensure enough development provisions so that the process of development is not disrupted and sufficient flexibility in the policy objectives is maintained. Keeping in view the hazards of international investment, the investment criteria should be based on realistic appraisal of the problems of the process of economic development, the uncertainties in the success of the investment project, the inflationary pressures and the danger of dependence on foreign loans. 
the problems of international investment do present challenge to intelligent planning in fact economic theory suggests that for all private and public sector projects and the decision about investment in these the cost benefit analysis should be used as this can be a useful tool for highlighting the potential cost and benefits of a decision although there are many limitations of this type of analysis such as benefits are more difficult to be quantified than the cost the analysis is not an exact analysis as different methodologies are adopted to assign economic values to non economic benefits the results are significantly different it is an imperfect analysis as it needs many subjective assumptions regarding the financial values of non economic values both in cost and benefits the analysis has a limited capacity to give results particularly in the assessment of environmental problems cost benefit analysis is generally conducted by ministry of finance which is not concerned with the environment Thus, cost benefit analysis and other related economic appraisal methodologies allow investors to determine the net economic returns to help them to ensure that investment decisions are accountable. In fact, economic criteria are not the only criteria by which the efficacy of the project is judged. multilateral lending agencies undertake formal economic analysis moreover there is always a widespread pressure that both the government resources and international resources are spent thoughtfully and their investment decisions are economically sound and viable since optimum allocation of scarce resources in less developed countries is an important factor for successful planning the scientific cost benefit analysis should be used for selection of projects particularly in the public sector in this cost benefit analysis shadow pricing should be used as the actual market prices do not indicate the real social benefits and social cost so from this module the summary which emerges is that the whole module is divided into two parts the first part gives you different criteria for investment coming from the developed countries to the developing nations various criteria and their problems have been summarized the second part of the module gives you suggestions and various methodologies which can try and help to remove the problems faced by the host countries as well as the recipient countries while inviting foreign investment particularly in terms of direct foreign investment the module concludes that the cost benefit analysis should be used for determining the level as well as the projects in which the foreign investment should be invited